Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Yvonne Brooks Show on this uh, post-Christmas, first post-Christmas show. So, Merry Christmas to everybody. Hope you had a great day. When was it? Today's yesterday, right? Yesterday was Christmas, so cool. Hope you had a great Christmas and uh, enjoyed uh, this most uh, benevolent of holidays. So, um, it's... Uh, we had fun. It was, it was a good day. Today was a good day. All right. Um, today I'm going to answer some Patreon, some questions that came from Patreon, from Patreon supporters. And I just want to give you a quick update about Patreon. Um, I, I'm, I've got everything set up on subscribestar.com, but they're having some problems uh, with uh, accepting new accounts. I'm waiting for confirmation from them. I'm hoping maybe later this week or, or sometime next week to get that confirmation. I'm also, of course, on hold with, um, uh, with what Jordan Peterson and, uh, and uh, Dave Rubin are going to do. So I'm kind of waiting to see uh, w what's up with them and whether they offer an alternative platform and a really good platform. I'm also considering, and I'm curious what you guys think, I'm also considering uh, adopting a Bitcoin platform. Not because I want Bitcoins, because I really don't, but because Bitcoin can't stop that. You know, Bitcoin's not like PayPal. They can boycott you. So what I can do with a Bitcoin wallet is you could make contributions to the show using Bitcoin. I can convert them immediately to dollars and not take the uh, exchange risk associated with Bitcoin. So I might do that. I want to see what the transaction costs are like. I have a feeling that for small amounts of money, Bitcoin is probably not the best solution but i'm i'm looking into it i probably i probably oh this is going to be rough i'm probably going to um set up a bitcoin wallet and uh let you know about a bitcoin platform that you can go and contribute to the show on so that i can um so another way to support that it'll be independent of paypal because i'm worried that the real problem here is is paypal that ultimately paypal is the one that at least to some extent and sometimes is what is uh, restricting the ability of some of these platforms uh, to carry certain people anyway all of this with the whole patreon thing is in flux it's it's all changing i'm not canceling patreon because it's still the only platform uh that is really viable for me right now to get your support i know a lot of you have dropped patreon uh, probably about 10% of my supporters are gone. They've dropped. Uh, some of them have now contributed uh, some money on PayPal.me. So I encourage those of you who, are, who have dropped Patreon or about to drop Patreon, then please go to PayPal.me slash Iran Book Show and you can make a contribution over there. At some point, we're going to have to coordinate all these different platforms, make sure that you're all getting the right kind of perks that are associated with a particular level of giving that you're providing. We'll beef up the perks. We'll, we'll, we'll improve some of the perks. We'll see which ones you're using, which ones you're not using, and try to give you more value for the money um, over, the next, over the next few months. But, but right now, everything is kind of... Uh, you're not supposed to drop Patreon. <laughs> you can drop Patreon if you want to. Some people are. As I said, about 10% of my supporters have dropped Patreon. Um, but... Uh, you know, if, if you don't if you don't think it's necessary, then don't. Um, and uh, if if you do, then please see if you can support me on PayPal.me. Um, I will at some point shut down my Patreon account and move it, but I'm waiting to see what are the legitimate alternatives. Right now, I have no legitimate alternatives to it. I'm also looking at how do I create a subscription service on my website. So it is a lot of uh, stuff going on and we probably won't see it really all pan out until until we get into deep into next year i see juan miranda has joined us from argentina i'm going to be in argentina in uh in september so we're going to have a bunch of interesting stuff going on in argentina in september so look forward to that all right uh today i'm going to answer some uh, patreon questions i'm going to answer some super chat questions so today's a great day to um hopefully you've saved up the money uh, that you know from the gift you didn't give, and uh, you have you have some money to to invest in asking questions on the super chat, because uh, we'll take super chat questions. We'll take these questions uh, that I have from Patreon. I have over one, two, three, four, five. I only have six questions to Patreon. We'll get through all of them. I don't think any of them are really really long questions, so I think we'll be fine. 
And then I already have one super chat question, so I'll get to it in a little while. And uh, uh, I, I don't even have an answer for you, Alex, really. Um, all right. Let's, let's start with super chat. Um, first one is about cronyism, right? So to what extent, if any, does a company's cronyism affect their right to discriminate in the marketplace? For example, if a media platform is government subsidized, then do they still have the same right to restrict speech on that platform? I think this is a really dangerous question and a really dangerous approach. Everything is subsidized today. Um, the government has its hands in everybody. It both subsidizes, it has contracts, it, um, it you know, we all drive government roads, uh, our kids go to government schools, M much of our services, that many of us use the post office, a lot of times the government has a monopoly over some of the stuff we use. What choice do companies have but to get the subsidies if their competitors are getting subsidies? What choice but if you're, if you're building a big company but to provide services to, to the government? So the government is in our lives, it's everywhere, it's in the corporate world, it's regulating, it's subsidizing, it's giving tax advantages to some and not to others, and it's, it's just a mess. If we then start thinking about every company that gets a government subsidies, as if it's somehow a government company, as if the government owns it, as if now it's, quote, a public space, a government-owned space, not that the government owns it technically, but you know what I mean, then, then I think forget about it. Then there is no free market anymore. Then we've given up, and it's gone. I would say the opposite. I would always err on the side of assuming an entity is private if it has private ownership. No matter how much it's regulated, no matter how much it's controlled. For example, there is no industry, there is no industry, more regulated and controlled than banking. But I don't think a bank is, is, is a public space, even though every decision a bank makes is approved by regulators, even though, in a sense, it's, it's a subsidiary of the government. But if we start treating the bank as if it's a government entity, then, you know, then we've sanctioned what the government is doing to that entity, and we lose all sense of what a free market is. We lose all sense of what private property means. What we should be doing, what we should be devoting our energies to, is instead of, for example, saying, oh, Facebook once got some government subsidies, therefore it's a public platform, therefore it shouldn't discriminate, and when it does discriminate, it's so-called censorship because it's an arm of the government, which is, in my view, bullshit and incredibly dangerous. What we should be doing is saying, Government shouldn't subsidize anybody. It shouldn't subsidize uh, Facebook. I don't know that Facebook gets any government subsidies, but it shouldn't subsidize Facebook. Uh, it shouldn't be big enough to have massive contracts. And every company, is, every company, every tech company has a heavy, heavy involvement with the government. I mean, the government is, a, is, a, is the biggest buyer in the world today, right? One of the companies I admire most, Amazon, has massive contracts with the government, huge for its, for its cloud services. And there's no accident that HQ2, Headquarters 2, one of the Headquarters 2 that they've done is close to Washington, D.C. Because Washington, D.C. is a massive client. And the same with Apple and the same with Google and the same with every single company out there. You can't get away from government today. It's so enmeshed in our lives. But to therefore assume that these companies, therefore, are public companies and treat them as if they're government-owned I, I, would be wrong the fact is that it's still private ownership, it's still private decision making, it's influenced in, 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 by government, but it is not owned by government. It is not an extension of government, J any more than I'm an extension of government, just because some of my life is sub so-called subsidized by the government. By the way, all these companies pay taxes, as do I but, I, but I still get some stuff from the government. Does that make me an arm of the government? Do I now, now need to behave as if I'm a public servant? No, I mean, that would be absurd. So I, I think it's very, very dangerous 
very dangerous to try to start again in a world in a mixed economy to try to start what well, we should be arguing for advocating for fighting for and investing our energy in is arguing against government subsidies arguing for separation of government from economics privatize these companies completely make them free fight for their freedom not attack them for accepting the subsidies not attack them by wanting to, to do away with their private property rights because supposedly the government subsidized somehow. All right, let's take a, uh, a quick um, super chat question. Okay, this is Alex. I'm looking for contemporary, contemporary fiction with characters that exemplify objectivist ethics. I've already read Terry Goodkind. Any suggestions? Unfortunately, no. Now, partially it's because I'm not a great expert in, in contemporary fiction. I don't read it as much as I probably should read, as much as I'd like to read. Um, so, I'm, you know, if you ask me about television shows or movies, I'm probably more proficient in that than in fiction. Uh, you say you've read Terry Goodkind. Yeah, I'd, I read Terry Goodkind, and Terry Goodkind's a friend, so Terry Goodkind's a good guy. Um, but they, I, I just don't know. I mean, Kira Peikoff has some novels that, uh, that, uh, that, that, are, that are good, so I would recommend reading, uh, I would recommend reading her novels. Um, you know, I'm sure there are others, and of course, there are older books. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many of you read a little novel called Shane. It's a, it's a Western. You might, might know the, uh, the old, there's a movie uh, called Shane, which is excellent, but, but that little novel called Shane is excellent. I love that book, and it, it is inspiring. It was emotional. It was heart-wrenching. It was just a, a, a really, really fun novel. So I, I think you can find, and maybe not contemporary, maybe not today, but going back 50 years, 100 years, I think you can buy, find some better novels. But sorry, I, I'm not a big help there. I wish I was. Uh, and by the way, if you find some good novels, contemporary novels, then please share it on, on the chat here and maybe send me an email or send me a message letting me know because I'd love to know about them. Okay, um, here's one more. All right, so this is Time Warp. And I, you know, you guys have got to ask questions, not assuming I know everything because I don't know. What do you think of the 4% rule when it comes to taking from your portfolio? I'm sorry, I don't know what the 4% rule is. So if you, if you add in the chat what the 4% rule is, I'll try to answer. I'm, I'm guessing what the 4% rule, but I don't want to guess. I want to just, just add in the chat what you think the 4% four, the rule is. Okay, here's another question related to finance as well, so I'll, I'll answer it. What is your opinion of bond index funds? By the way, these Patreon questions are from people who support me on Patreon. Uh, you know, if you give more than $25, I think you get to propose topics, and then everybody gets to vote on those topics. So, uh, so uh, uh, you, if, if, you, if you support me on Patreon, you get to do that. Um, I'm looking for your answer, but I don't see the answer about the 4% rule. Okay, let's keep going. What is your opinion of bond index funds? Well, I mean, it's a great way to invest in bonds. I mean, if I were investing in bonds, and, and most people should probably, and I probably am invested in bonds, um, I use an index fund. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go pick the particular bonds. It's just too much rule. It's too much, um, it, it, it's too much work. Uh, and, and I don't know that I can pick any better bonds than anybody else. And the best way to invest in anything is to invest cheaply, effectively in a variety of different index fund. And so the only decision is really, are you going to have 20% bonds, 30% bonds, 40% bonds? And then the other question, which I think is really important, is what kind of duration do you want in the bonds? Do you want long-term bonds or short-term bonds, which, which can make a big difference? I have for a long time only invested in short-term bonds, but that has turned out to be a bad strategy because I always tend to think that interest rates are too low and yet they keep getting lower. So if you'd invested in long-term bonds, you would have made money. Um, so don't follow my investment advice, please. I'm not giving any. I'm just saying it's a cheap way to invest in bonds where you only have to choose then the duration, the type of the bond, and let the, and let the market you know, kind of rule because I don't think any of us are particularly very good at picking, unless you're PIMCO, which is the largest and best uh, bond investment company in the world, uh, picking which particular bonds are going to outperform other bonds. Just buy the index and be done with it. So um, I'm all for bond index funds, again, with specific characteristics, particular maturities, particular type of bonds, because they're government bonds. 
there's high yield bonds, junk bonds, there's corporate bonds, there's all there's municipal bonds, there's all kinds of bonds, all kinds of bonds, and use um, and use those. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, we got some answers about the four percent rule. I think four percent is twenty five years of retirement to death. I don't know what that is. The four percent rule has long been the standard as far as retirement plan withdrawals go. The rule states that if you begin by withdrawing 4% of your nest egg's value during your first year of retirement, then adjust subsequent withdrawals for inflation, you'll avoid running out of money for 30 years. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, okay. Okay, S don't do any rules. If that's the rule, then I, 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 it doesn't really make any sense to me. 4% uh, rule withdrawing no more than 4% of the value of the retirement every year, I believe. Well, it depends. What is the return? How many years do you think you're going to live? When, when do you retire? Are you retiring at 50? Are you retiring at 85? I expect to start withdrawing from my retirement fund when the law requires me to do so, which is, I think, 72 or something like that. Um, so it's very contextual. It very much, very much depends on how much money you've got in retirement, when you're retirement, how long you think you're going to live, do you have a spouse, is it just you, did they have, are you taking Social Security, how much is Social Security, how, how, mu how much money do you want to live on, are you working part-time? So I don't believe in any, any simple rules like that. You've got to do the analysis. You've got to do the analysis. Did the, the market just drop 25%? Maybe if the market just dropped 25%, like it did in December, it, you know, from the peak in in the, in, in um, in September to today, or till yesterday, because today it went up for, uh, five six percent. Maybe you should um, maybe you should take out less this year. Maybe you should say, okay, this year I'm going to really be frugal because my retirement funds just took a big hit, and I should be more careful this year. So it, 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 there are too many factors to have rules. So I don't believe in rules. Okay, T well I believe in some rules, but I don't believe in rules like that. Simple oversimplifications. And I know this is why you should have a good financial advisor who has your interests in mind, that you're, you're comfortable working with them. They can show you a spreadsheet model of what it looks like, what your expectations are, that they're realistic. Test them, you know, uh, get second opinions. Do it like a doctor. It's important. Your retirement fund are important. Get a second opinion. Make sure it all makes sense. And, and, and be guided by a spreadsheet, not by some rule. Are most middle-class jobs today government jobs? No, not in the U.S. Most middle-class jobs are private jobs, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly so. Government is still relatively small. I mean, it's a growing employer in the United States, but it's still relatively small as compared to the private sector. The private sector, particularly for middle-class jobs, is overwhelming. I mean, think of all the programming jobs. Think of all tech jobs. Those are all middle-class jobs. They're good you know, high paying and maybe upper middle class jobs with the middle class jobs. Um, jobs, you know, management jobs. Mostly that's private sector. So no, the US economy is far from getting to the point where uh, the government dominates middle class jobs. All right, uh, let's see. All right, got a bunch of uh, super chat questions. That's good. All right. Um, Okay, everyone other than us, us being us, me and a few other people, uh, identifies Western civilization with Chris Christendom. And the best current work of our civilization comes from South Korea. I guess he's talking about, uh, talking about uh, technology and automobiles and things like that. Isn't it time to switch to human civilization or just civilization? Yeah, I mean, civilization is good. The, the only thing is you want to differentiate it. You want, because there've been lots of civilizations in history. Western civilization does not refer to where that civilization is thriving today. Indeed, in many respects, Western civilization is doing better in Asia than it is in, in Europe and the United States. It's in decline in Europe and the United States. Western civilization relates, in my view, to two ideas, individualism and, well, and respect for reason. And, and as a consequence of that, a respect for markets, so a market economy. So those three aspects, reason, individualism, capitalism, or markets. Those are the three. And I call it Western civilization because it refers to a time and a place where this civilization 
was born. And then I articulate what I mean by that. And I, often when I talk about Western civilization, I say, well, but that includes anybody who adopts these values. And I know that people, um, people associate with Christendom, but in my view, one of the most important battles that those of us who are fighting for civilization must fight and must win is to divorce civilization from Christianity. To show the world, the Western civilization, the founding of America, is not a product of Christendom, but a product of the Enlightenment, of the Enlightenment values, of Enlightenment ideas, of Enlightenment thinkers, and that they were primarily dominantly secular, and that the key idea of the Enlightenment is in its alternative name. The Enlightenment is also called the Age of Reason. So if we're going to fight for civilization, one of the only ways we can do that, one of the only ways we can do that is by separating the idea of Western civilization from Christianity. And I don't believe we should give up on that fight. I think it's an important fight. And I think it's important for the Koreans and for the Japanese and for some of the Chinese and whoever is adopting Western civilization to know what they're adopting. That is to identify the characteristics of, 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 that they are taking from the West, that they're adopting from the West. Isn't it cultural ex expropriation? Ooh, I think, we should, I think we should go after the Koreans and the Chinese and all these people for, for, I mean, it's our culture. Wait a minute, it's ours, right? We, you know, Europeans. You know, the cultural expropriation now, if you, if you get dressed up like a, like, I don't know, like an Indian, or you get dressed up as a, um, or you eat, if you're, if you're European and you eat Japanese food, you're expropriating their culture, or you do fusion, and there's the, the left is like completely nuts and crazy and infantile about this. But they never talk about it in reverse. They never talk about the values other cultures take from the West, which is the dominant cultural so-called expropriation. But no, so I, I'm all for keeping Western civilization and identifying it as an 18th century phenomena, as a product of the Enlightenment, as a product that starts with, the, with Aquinas and the Renaissance and the rediscovery. Really, its roots are in Greece and the Greek identification of reason and individualism. Um, that's what makes it so, and, and teaching that and talking about that. And I think Western civilization is not a shortcut for that, and we must fight the battle to separate it from the idea of Christianity. All right, we've got a bunch of super chat questions, and then we've got another three Patreon questions. Okay, Michael asks, are nihilist intellectuals smart enough to know that the reaction to their nihilism is what will bring on the destruction, not the nihilism itself? No, I don't. Well, smart is not the right. I don't know who's smart and who's not. I, I don't know what that means. I think, uh, you know, a lot of these nihilist intellectuals have very high IQs. Does that mean they're smart? I don't know. Does that mean they're smart enough? I don't know. Are they sophisticated enough? Are they thinkers enough? Do they understand that the real danger the nihilism is creating, which is what Leonard Peikoff predicts, is the backlash against the nihilism. It's the authoritarianism which will, which will result from the nihilism. No, I don't think, I think, I think that idea scares them and that idea, they reject that idea. They, they, and they don't, you see, most nihilists don't think of themselves as nihilists. To be a nihilist is really painful. To be a nihilist is to give up on life. It's to accept death as your standards, to accept destruction and darkness as the standard. Almost nobody does that. I mean, it's, it's like, like Elsa Tui is a nihilist fully aware of it, but like Elza Tui from the Fountainhead. But I don't think most intellectuals are that self-aware that they know the nihilists. I think they're power lusters, and they want power, and maybe they know that. Maybe they know they want power, but they convince themselves, they convince themselves that they want power because they want to do good. They convince themselves that their nihilistic policies like tearing down Western civilization is because they really love, I don't know, African civilization, African culture, or whatever culture, whatever primitive culture they want to adopt. Um, 
So they, they, it's not that they are, it's not that they think, ooh, let's destroy some stuff today. I'm a hater. I'm a hater and I want to destroy. No. They think they love. They think they're pro something. They're not. Because there's nothing there. And, and deep down they know that. But they're not aware of that. You know, in Atlas Shrugged, what happens to James Taggart when he realizes that what he really wants is to destroy. What he really wants is to inflict pain on John Galt. What he really wants is to knock stuff down. He goes crazy. I mean, certifiable, real crazy. Because for a human being to hold, I am evil. You can't do it. So they have to create rationalizations. They have to create explanations in their own mind. They have to hide their own awareness from the facts that are just beyond that awareness. Don't look there. And Ayn Rand called the great, you know, the real evil in the world is evasion. These people evade, and the thing they evade the most is their knowledge of themselves. So they can come across as, I'm just doing this out of love, and, and I'm just doing this out of, uh, I want to help people, I want to help minorities, I want to help poor people, I want to help... Uh, because they're really convinced of that. That's not what's driving them. They're haters. And you can see that by their actions and what works and what doesn't and whether they learn anything when what they do fails. But they can't hold the hatred. They can't hold the evil in conscious awareness. So they repress it. They suppress it. They hide it from themselves. Okay, one more. Uh, what do you think, Elizabeth, Warren legislation of government competition within the generic drug market and our current prices market failure. Okay, so the question, Moses, M Moses, I think it's his name. The question is not completely coherent to me. It's not, try to write, you know, there's a reason, and I'm not, maybe English is not your first language, I'm not criticizing you. But there's, any, there's a reason why grammar is important, why commas and like structuring sentences uh, is important, because it's, it's hard to understand a sentence that's not grammatically well written. Um, I don't think current prices are market failures. I think current prices are government failures. Uh, so drug industry is heavily, heavily regulated. It's heavily regulated because some of its biggest buyers are Medicare and Medicaid, which means the government. It's heavily regulated because the health insurance market in the United States is heavily regulated. And the way the health insurance market functions heavily, strongly distorts market prices of medical products, including drugs. So drug companies are victims of the regulations on insurance companies. And then it's heavily regulated because the FDA is a regulatory agency that makes the life of drug companies, uh, you know, really, really, really hard and distorts the prices that they can actually provide in the marketplace. So you've got multiple levels at which government has distorted market prices. So the problem with the drug market today, generic and regular, is government regulation, government control of all these aspects of healthcare that distort prices. So I don't know what prices would be in a truly free market. I assume they'd be cheaper and there'd be a lot more competition and there'd be a lot more variety and a lot more innovation and we'd be decades ahead of where we are today in terms of innovation and new drugs. So I never think, ever think, that it is justified to regulate, to, to create competition. Suddenly, I think it's evil and, and horrific to create a government competition, as if such a thing can exist. I mean, the best government competition that exists is the post office versus UPS and FedEx. And you know how that's working out for the post office. And the only reason it exists is because the post office has some monopoly power. And once you give the government a, a government drug company then it will gain over time monopoly power and private genetic, private drug makers would go out of business. So I, government should not produce drugs. Government should not own any companies under any circumstances. And uh, whatever failures there might be in the marketplace for drugs, they are all government failures. Again, we should not ever, ever propose solutions to perceived problems that involve government getting more intrusive, 
that involve government violating more rights, that involve government getting more powerful. One of my big objections to building walls and immigration, I hate to bring this up because I know you all freak out, is I believe in limited government. Now you want to you want to you want to spend billions and billions and probably tens tens or many tens of billions of dollars to give government even more power so that they can have another police force on the border with walls and guns and drones and all this stuff. No, I, I want government to have less power. I'm I'm afraid of government power. I don't want to give any government agency more power than it has today. I want to restrict. And suddenly in the realm of economics, never, ever, ever propose a solution that increases the, gov- the power of government within the marketplace. All our solutions as advocate for free markets, all of them should be realistic in terms of the ability, to imp- the willingness to implement them today or not, should always be get the government out of that industry, get the government out of regulating, get the government out of subsidizing, get the government out of giving tax advantages or disadvantage, get the government out of economics, get the government out of economic involvement. That should o- The only type of proposal we should be offering is to, is to increase the protection of rights, to decrease the violation of rights. Never is a solution appropriate that increases the violation of rights, which is what Elizabeth Warren is suggesting. Okay, another super chat question, then I'll go to another Patreon question. What do you think of living frugally for the first third of your life to boost saving, given possible future job market volatility due to AI and automation? Um, I'm against it because for, for a lot of reasons. Well, one of the reasons I think is you always have to work. Work is a part of life. You need a purpose in life. And most of us, the purpose comes from a career. It comes from work that we do. So the idea that I'm going to retire at the age of 40 or 35, as I see some people, what are you going to do after 35? What are you going to do? And between the age of 20 and 35 are pretty cool years. They're exciting years. And, you know, if you're interested in my views on these things, my personal finance video, I did a video a, a couple of months back on personal finance. I'm a big believer in living, living every part of your life to the fullest. And that means taking some financial risk if you're confident that you will have a job in the future. Now, you're saying the problem of job volatility due to AI and automation. The best thing to do with regard to AI and automation is to figure out, is my job at risk? If my job is at risk, how do I train myself to a different job that has lower risk? How do I keep my knowledge to, at such a level that I will never be replaced? How can I be the best that I can be so AI will not replace me? Or how do I switch jobs to a job that AI is unlikely to replace me within my career? Or how do I switch careers multiple times during my lifetime? I think gone are the days where we can assume we're going to have one career and that's it. We're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to be engaged. We're going to have to care and invest time and thought into what we want to do in the next stage of our life. What happens when we live to be 150? You're not going to retire for the last 100 years of your life. You're going to have multiple careers. And, and you want to embrace each one of them. And you want to think in advance what career is suitable for you, what you would enjoy. And you want to always be looking for where the new opportunities. Now, I don't believe, I believe job market volatility will occur, but I don't think the number of jobs is going to go down. I think the number of jobs is going to go up. There's always going to be work to be done. And then the question is figuring out what jobs are going to be created by automation and how do I get on top of that? How do I get in front of the line? How do I create an interesting, fascinating, exciting life? And the idea that I'm not going to live well, what happens if you die at 40? And, and you've just spent 20 years of your life being frugal and, 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 and uh, you know, not living to your potential and not going out on dates and not having kids and, and, and not going to nice restaurants and not going traveling and seeing the world and not going to museums because you're working, because you're saving, because one day you'll lose your job. I mean, generally, I think life and fear is a bad thing. So I think a conscious effort to figure out what the issues are and how to protect yourself and how to plan for a multi-career lifespan is the right approach to that kind of issue, not living frugally in such a way that, um, you know, is going to diminish the quality of your life right now. You should live, 
I mean, there's something, there's something real to the saying that you should live every day like it's your last day on earth. Because any day could be your last day on earth. And every day is a day you'll never get back. Every day is a day you'll never get back. Every second never comes back. Every wasted minute is a minute you will never have. Life is so unbelievably precious. Even if you get to live to be 90, 100, that's such a short period of time. I mean, it pisses me off to no end to know that I'm going to die. Life's too good. What the hell? I don't want this to end. And I'm curious how the story plays out. So I don't want to like say, okay, next five years, I'm going to not have fun. No, I want to have fun and fun in the broad sense, fun qua human being. I want to enjoy my life as a human being every day. I want to do something interesting, see something stimulating, read something, you know, broaden my mind in some significant way every day if I can. That's living, right? Taste something new. Plan a new, you know, do the stuff that makes your life meaningful, right? It's part of why I do so many of these podcasts. It's because it's fun. I enjoy it. It's stimulating. It keeps my life interesting. Why would I want to? Anyway, you get the drift, right? Okay, here's a question. In an objectivist society, would congressional representation be chosen via election? If so, would the elections be run by private companies competing for the business, or would the government run the election? I suspect the government would run the election, and yes, congressional representation would be chosen by election. Now, who would be able to vote? What would they be voting for exactly? Would, they, would it be direct representation or indirect representation? Um, would everybody vote, or just those who pay taxes, or what age I mean there's a lot of technicality how you would structure vote who would supervise the voting I think it would have to be the, the government run it although they would obviously use private machines and private networks and things like that but there's a lot of technicality to figuring out an optimal election system I mean the founding fathers spent a lot of thinking a lot of thought on how to structure voting and how to structure the division of powers and how to structure what we, the Supreme Court we don't vote on, Congress we vote one way, Senate we voted a different way, the president a completely different way, and, and, and they really thought this through. And I think when we approach the day where we have a completely objectivist society or a true free society, a lot of thought by legal philosophers, I think, would have to go into the technicalities of what such a society looks like, what does voting look like, so what are the division of powers within government, how do you write a new constitution, what would that constitution be composed of? All of that kind of thinking would have to happen as we approach that day. I don't have the answers to those things. I don't think about them because I find them relatively irrelevant because it's not going to happen in my lifetime. <clears throat> so, you know, why expend the brain power? I, there, there's, such, there's such more in a sense, more important things that have to be dealt with way before, like how, how do we convince people to move towards a free society? How do we convince people to get rid of subsidies, controls, regulations? How do we get the government out of our lives, stop listening to us, stop uh, f spying on us? How do we get the government out of our lives? How, how do we protect free speech? I mean, right now, much of what we do, unfortunately, is, is self-defense. It's like we're being attacked and we're, we're, we're shooting. We're not at the point where we're planning the future society because it's so remote. It's so remote. Oh, for those of you speculating about my retirement, um, I don't think you should worry. Uh, I don't think you should worry. I, I, I have no plans to retire anytime. I don't know. This millennia? No, I'm, I'm kidding. But I, I don't have any plans to retire. Uh, now, in part, I'll retire, right? Because I can't, I can't, like, keep my travel schedule the way I have it right now forever. I'm just getting too old. So at some point, I won't be giving 100 talks a year in 27 different countries and four different continents. I mean, that will have to, that will have to change. I, my, my assumption is that once I cross age 60, I can't believe I'm getting close to age 60. Oh, my God. Um, I'll start slowing down my travel over time. Um, but 
that will only make it easier for me to do podcasts and stuff like that. And that, I just don't see why I would ever stop, right? So 90, 90 is a pretty good age to retire if I'm going to retire ever. Now, at some point I'll have to retire because as it is right now, half the time I can't remember stuff. So once I, once I am babbling, once you guys let me know that I'm babbling and making no sense or that I can't remember anything, then I'll retire. Maybe I'll retire, you know, so, so try, to, try to help me out so I don't, I don't descend before I retire. All right, let's take a couple of Super Chat questions. I mean, as long as you guys continue to ask me questions, that's a sign that you gain some value. And uh, that's that's reason for me to keep doing this. What do you think of living? Uh, that, I did that already. Okay. What is it like being a Jew, Israeli, visiting Germany for the first time? A German still deeply anti-Semitic in your view? That's a good question. Um, first time I so I avoided Germany, and I still don't like going to Germany because of the history. Um, and I, I apologize to all the German fans. I know I have a lot of them who listen to the podcast, but it's just a reality. I was so inculcated when I was young with stories of the Holocaust, of, uh, you know, in, uh, the history is so ingrained in us from when we're very, very young in Israel that it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to ignore that history when you're in Germany. I remember, first time I was in Germany, I was in Austria, and to travel, I think, between Salzburg and Vienna, we had to cross through some German territory. And I have to say, it was, it was weird. It felt weird. It felt ugh, a little off-putting. And then when I traveled uh, properly to Germany, to Berlin, I gave a talk. I've given talks now in a number of German cities. I was uncomfortable. I have to say, I felt uncomfortable. Now, it's not based on anything in current German society, so I don't think the Germans are necessarily right now deeply anti-Semitic. I think they could become deeply anti-Semitic again. I don't think the ideas that led to the anti-Semitism are gone, and I think, therefore, I think, I think you're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism in the U.S. I think you're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism all over Europe, and I think you could see a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in Germany, but it's not... It's not, it's not the anti-Semitism in Germany that makes me feel uncomfortable. It's the presence of history. It's, you know how, well, I, I don't know if you know how, but like when I go to Athens and I'm walking in Athens, I remember once being there with, I mean, this isn't dropping names, but I remember once being there with Lena Peikoff and we're walking or we're sitting at a restaurant and it was like Aristotle was here. Like, he walked in these streets, Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and the great sculptors of Greece and the great playwriters of Greece. They were right here on, on these pavements. They, they walked in these walls and some of these stones and some of these things. They were there when they were there. And you get the sense of, whoa, that is so cool. I mean, it, it, it's kind of a, 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 a fleeting thing. It's not something that you can really put your fingers on, but it's, it's cool to be in the presence of a place of giants, of heroes, of your giants, of your heroes. It's like going to Monticello or to, or to, or to you know, uh, um, uh, George Washington's home, I forget. Um, and, and, you know, they're not there. You don't get to meet Thomas Jefferson, but you're in a place. And it's not just that it's cool that it's his house and his stuff, but it, he was here. He walked these corridors. Wow, giants, great men walked in these corridors. And then you go to Berlin and you go, you know, Hitler drove along the street and... This is where the Jewish ghetto was, where they rounded them all up and they took them to their concentration camps. And you get that same kind of sense of place. And it's yucky, particularly knowing that if you had been there, you would be one of the people rounding up. If your family, all of us, you know, all of us who were Israeli, most of us who were Israeli had family that was being rounded up and killed. A lot of my family was killed during the Holocaust. So it, it, it's very, it's, it's the opposite of what you get from Greece or what you get from the Founding Fathers or what you get from, from like, oh, Naples, uh, Florence. I love walking on Florence. And part of the love of it is Michelangelo was here. I mean, isn't this cool? Like, I can touch this thing that Michelangelo created, you know, a sculpture of his or be in the presence of. It's just so, so cool. And you get the opposite. The, you get the ugliness when you're in Germany. It's like these horrible, horrific Disgusting things happened here. And, and while, you know, a small percentage of the population did them, the rest of the population knew and did nothing about them. 
And it's, it's, this was a culture. This, these people, the, the ancestors of these people did it. And it's not that I blame these people. It's just it gives me a negative emotion being there. So I, I don't like being in Germany. I've, I've, I, I don't like hearing the German language. I, 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 I get a, 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 an emotional reaction to both. I overcome it because if I need to go to Germany to give a talk, and when I talk to German students, I don't like when liberal Deutsch ask questions here, I don't hold it against them that he's German because I can overcome the emotion. But if you ask me how does it feel like, it, it's definitely, it's definitely an emo, a negative emotional response. All right, one more Super Chat question, then we'll go back to Patreon. Roughly how much of the current market downturn is Trump's anti-trade policies versus what the Fed is doing? Trump blames the Fed. That's really hard to tell. It, it's really, really hard to tell. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it's just Trump's. I mean, if you ask how much of it is Trump versus how much of it is the Fed, I think that would be a better thing because I don't think the market is just pricing uh, trade. I think Trump, the market is pricing a democratic victory in the House, which creates all kind of political uncertainty, including the possibility of impeachment. I think uh, uh, a Mathis resigning creates all kind of political uncertainty. It takes an adult, assuming that Donald Trump is the equivalent of a child, which I think he is mentally. Um, it takes an adult out of the White House, and what is Trump going to do next? Um, uh, Kelly resigned, and who's going to replace him, and is he any good? And what does that reflect about the ability of the White House to function? Um, tax cuts have happened. The good news, deregulation kind of has happened. Is there any good news in the future? Doubtful. Um, can Donald Trump get anything done that's good, given that the House is, is dominated by Democrats? No, probably he'll compromise with Democrats and get bad stuff done. On top of that, there's trade. Uh, you know, on top of that, there's his hints about socialized medicine. So I think there's a Trump factor, which I would say is probably 75% of the market decline, and probably 25% is the Fed. And even the Fed, you can't divorce from Trump because I think a big part of the market's reaction, maybe it's 50, 25, 25. 25% of the market reaction might very well be Trump's bashing of the Fed. I mean, it's unprecedented the degree in which he is attacking the Federal Reserve. And the notion is, at least nominally, is that the Fed is independent. It's a government entity, but it's independent from politics. It doesn't determine interest rates based on politics. Now, it does. We all know it does to some extent. For example, the Fed has never increased interest rates during an election year. Never increased interest rates during an election year when an incumbent was running. So never did something to hurt an incumbent by raising interest rates. So it's always been political. But for president to bash it and to imply that he could fire the Fed chairman and to, to politicize the decision about interest rates in an explicit way is so negative that I think the market reacted very, very negatively to that. And that's why Mnuchin tried over the weekend to say, hey, no, Trump understands he can't fire Powell. He can't really do this. But I don't think the market was buying that, given Trump's tweets, even today, on Monday. Now, the market went up a lot today, because what I think has happened is, look, the market has basically priced a recession into next year. And I think what the, re what the market realized over the, last, um, over the last few days is that ultimately a recession, there's a probability it'll happen, but it's not as high as the values that the market was pricing estimates it as. And at the end of the day, what the Fed said is our models, the Fed's models, whatever you want to believe about the Fed's models, say there's not going to be a recession. Now, I don't particularly buy into the Fed's models, but I think the market does to some extent. And the market is saying, okay, maybe the recession's not going to be early this year. Maybe it's going to be late in the year, maybe even in 2020. Maybe there's a probability there's no recession. And it adjusted its expectations and people felt like the market was oversold and they all bought in today. Uh, taking into account, rethinking the probability of a recession. Um, but I think generally the market is fearful of, of Trump and of the, the, the reality, the economic reality that we're entering into. I think, you know, uh, it's hard to tell what the market thinks of a government shutdown. I think generally the market doesn't care that much because the government shutdown is not that significant one way or the other. Um, okay, so let's take us a, a Patreon question. What is the free market? How is it created? What does it do? Whoops. 
What does it do? Does it apply to just economic matters or can it be applied elsewhere? A free market is a free market. It is a market free of coercion. It is a market free of coercion by other market participants and a market free of coercion primarily of um, government. So a free market is created when you have a government that protects us in the marketplace from those who would use coercion. This is why anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction of term. There is no free markets under anarchy because in anarchy, there's no government to protect us from those who would use coercion in the marketplace. Under anarchy, coercion is one mechanism by which it's legitimately, uh, you, can, you can deal with one another. So that's why... Uh, uh, capitalism, free markets require government and why government is a necessary good. Um, so free markets are free of coercion, free of force. And where there's a government that protects property rights but otherwise leaves uh, those participants in the marketplace free. It is a market phenomena, which means an economic phenomena. It's what we do in the marketplace. And, uh, but generally... All the government's job is in the marketplace and elsewhere and in every other aspect of our lives is to protect individual rights, nothing else. So in terms of the role of government, the role of government's role is the same in every aspect of our life, except in the aspect of force, except in the aspect of the retaliatory use of force that we've granted the government a monopoly over. In every other respect, it's there to protect our rights. But it is different in the sense that free market relates to market, relates to economics. Um, how is it created? It's created by the creation of such a government. It's created by default. It's what happens when you extract coercion from the marketplace. When you have an entity that is supervising the marketplace and attempting to, to secure it, to, to, to make it free of coercion. What does it do? Nothing. Whatever you want it to do, whatever, whatever participants want it to do, it involves trade. And as long as that trade does not violate individual rights, the government doesn't intervene. And it does, the trade just happens, and I, you know, it just, just allows it to happen. I think that answers the question. If you want, you can ask a follow-up. All right, let's take uh, Abtin's question. Which modern country or culture has the healthiest attitude towards sex? You know, I don't know. It's really hard to tell because the modern attitudes towards sex alternate between uh, the Christian attitude towards sex, which dominates, I think, American society, and its backlash, which is a materialistic view of sex and for promiscuity. Um, you know, strip clubs, uh, uh, prostitution, and all of that. And, and just overly promiscuity among young people when it comes to sex. So that's American culture, which I think is a very unhealthy culture because it's dominated by a Christian attitude towards sex and the backlash to that. I mean, I, I generally think that, that uh, the attitude towards sex is healthier in Europe. It tends to be more promiscuous, but, but I think that's it's not a bad thing necessarily. That is, it depends how promiscuous it is. Um, it's, not quite as a, it's not quite as, I don't know, fixated on, on rejecting Christianity because I think they rejected Christianity, at least this part of Christianity, a long time ago. It's too materialistic in, in, um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, but, I, you know, but there's no culture that is abandoned materialism today. So. And then there's like the Indian Kama Sutra attitude towards sex. But it, and it's hard. I don't know enough about that culture. I don't know how spiritual that is. It, it seems, at least from the Kama Sutra poses, it seems very kind of physical and materialistic and pleasure-oriented. And I think, I think to the extent that it's pleasure-oriented, that's a good thing. I'm all for focusing on pleasure and enhancing pleasure and figuring out ways to enhance pleasure. And, and you know, if, if that means 225 poses, then so be it. I'm not against that, but again, I don't know that any culture today or any cult country today has the right balance of the spiritual value of sex with the physicality, with the, with the um, uh, uh, pleasure aspect of sex and combining those two. Because, of course, the spiritual aspect of sex, 
dramatically enhances the pleasure aspect of, of, of sex. But the pleasure aspect of sex can't be ignored, even separate from the spiritual side of it. Uh, I mean, personally, I, I believe in erring more on the side of, of, uh, of promiscuity than on the side of chastity. I'm not sure Ayn Rand would hold that position. I think she probably would prefer to err on the side of chastity versus on the side of promiscuity. But think about Dagny, or for that matter, um, Dominique, in Alice Shrugged and in, um, in The Fountainhead. I mean, I think each one of them sleeps with at least three men during the novel. Now, they're all, at least in Atlas Shrugged, they're all men of substance that they really love, but they're not the love. Only one of the men is the love, right? And I won't give that away. Um, in Fountainhead, Dominique sleeps with men she doesn't necessarily love. I mean, she sleeps with, uh, with what's his name? Um, Keating. And granted, that's not an example of what the sex should be, but it, it shows that Ayn Rand was not exactly a prude when it comes to, 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 to sex. So, you know, I was shocked coming from Israel, which has a much healthier attitude towards sex, coming to America, it, to see how prudish and Christian the culture in the U.S. is. And as a consequence, when you're secular, the rebellion against that is pure materialism. Pure materialism. Um, so I suspect... Europe has a, a, a slightly healthier attitude towards sex than the United States. I don't know about Asia. I, I really, that would be interesting. It would be interesting to figure out what the attitude in a place like China or South Korea is towards sex. Now, if you watch the show that I loved. Um, okay, so let me say something about the show. Um, what was it called? Um, Mr. Sunshine, which was a Korean show, which I loved and I highly recommend, which is on Netflix. It has a fantastic view of love. I mean, I mean, I, I think I told you a little bit about this on other shows. It's it's three men; they all love the same woman, and she loves one of them, and and their relationship is clearly spiritual and values oriented, and passionate, and yet the whole show there's no sex, and, and that is suspicious. I mean, and I think it deterred from my enjoyment of the show. Because the fact that the hero and the heroine who love each other passionately, they didn't even kiss, I don't think. I think kiss on a cheek or something. There wasn't a passionate kiss, and there was, there was not sex even once between them. I think it's sad and, and unnecessary. And again, it has to do with the kind of prudishness that Korean culture has. And I don't know where it comes from, and I don't know why. Um, it also has to do with one of the premises of the movie, but I think, I think the sex would have overcome the premise. She's from an aristocratic family, and he's, he's from a slave family. So the sex would have shattered that barrier. Their love began the shattering. The sex would have shattered it completely. And I think the biggest flaw in the whole show was the fact that they never had sex. Now, granted, I probably have one of the more, what would be the term? Um more uh, uh, opposite of prudish, promiscuous, whatever, opposite of prudish attitudes within objectivism about sex. So I believe you should have it. Have it often, have it with people you like, enjoy it, find pleasure in it. Hopefully you can find a soulmate that you can have the best sex of your life with, but don't deny yourself sex because you can't find your soulmate. Um, how would you respond to someone who calls people like Oscar Schindler altruists? I try to explain to them why they're not altruists, why um, people like Oscar Schindler were, were egoists in a sense that they cared about their own lives, they cared about their own values, and they didn't want to live in a world in which they did not do. They didn't want to live with themselves. So you have to understand the concept of integrity and why integrity is so crucial to being selfish. And how integrity is so crucial to being moral, to being happy, and to being successful as a human being. And to live in a world that Oscar Schindler lived in. To know you could save people who were murdered for no reason. To, 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 to not stand up in the face of one of the greatest injustices in human history would be self-destructive. So what Schindler exhibits is the characteristics of integrity. 
of, 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 a, of integrity to his personal values. He wasn't an objectivist. He wasn't an egoist. But what he did was not sacrifice himself for some, something beyond himself. He took a risk. He risked in life for his own values, for his own virtues. He acted out his virtues. He acted out his morality. And his morality was that one does not stand idly by when a massive injustice happens. And I think, I think that is an egoistic value. Now, even if he did not hold it as an egoistic value, it is an egoistic value. Um, now, it's true that sometimes it's difficult in the motivations of other people to identify what is altruism and what is not. It's, it's hard. I'll give you an example. So I put up the movie, I put up my review of the movie a, few, a couple of days ago of It's a Wonderful Life. And I hate that movie because I think that the hero of the movie is an altruist and has sacrificed everything that he holds dear for the sake of other people. And people said, no, no, you don't get it. You missed it all. Yeah, he, he had a hard time and he gave up stuff. But in order to achieve a greater value, family and community and the love of his clients, and, and I think that's complete nonsense. And if you see the movie and if you see exactly what happens in the movie and what's the motivations on, what motivates him and why he's trying to commit suicide and, and, uh, and how he runs his bank and how everything he does in his life, he does not consider his life qua life important. And he's living for the sake of others. And it's destroying him. And it's why he wants to commit suicide. And he is an altruist. But see... When you grow up with altruism, you're inculcated with this idea that no, 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 no. Because nobody, see, this is the point I want to make. Nobody actually advocates for altruism. Nobody actually advocates for altruism except a few philosophers and maybe a few priests on Sunday. But most Protestant Christian priests don't. If you walk into an evangelical church today, they don't advocate for altruism. Qua altruism, that is, they don't advocate for complete self-negation. They don't advocate for living for the sake of others purely and never thinking of yourself. They don't advocate for real self-sacrifice like Jesus on a cross, suffering for the sins of others, bleeding, suffering, dying for the sins other people committed. Nobody, except for a few philosophers and a few preachers, advocates for that because it is an unbelievably unpopular view. Nobody actually wants to hold that. Nobody wants to live that way except Mother Teresa. So what do they preach? They say, look, if you sacrifice, I mean, Jordan Peterson does this. Everybody does this. As an oh, Siri thought I was talking to her for some reason. So my phone just activated. Siri just activated. Anyway, so what do they say? And this is why altruism is so insidious and so sneaky and so tricky and so difficult to identify. What they say is, the joy you get from other people is so immense. It's so wonderful that a small sacrifice today is rewarded by massive benefits in the future. Or, you should make a lot of money. Jesus wanted you to make a lot of money. Go and listen to some of these evangelical preachers. And then when you make a lot of money, give it away. Give it to these other people. Right? Remember, Jesus made it possible for you to have a lot of money. So you have to share that money with them. So they, they've, they've given you guilt. They've given you that you did not really own it. Jesus made it possible for you to have a lot of money. You didn't make it yourself. So it's always, always portrayed as you'll either have a better life in this world because of the altruism, because of the sacrifice, because of helping other people. Or your benefit in an afterlife. I mean, Christianity was very sophisticated, understood that nobody is motivated by altruism. Nobody is motivated by pure sacrifice and suffering. So they said, oh, no, no. Judaism wasn't this sophisticated. And I think one of the reasons Christianity is so much more successful than Judaism is because of this. Judaism says, you, whatever happens on this earth happens on this earth. There's no real afterlife. Christianity said, oh, no, 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 no. You see, we want you to suffer in this world. We want you to sacrifice in this world. We want to give, you're going to give everything up in this world. We want the meek to inherit the earth. We want you to help the meek and do everything we can for the meek and risk everything for the meek. 
but we'll give you an afterlife. So every ideology that's been successful, Marxism, fascism, communism, Christianity, provides an egoistic motivation in the afterlife or, you know, in, in the end of It's a Wonderful Life. All the people around, oh, what a wonderful person you are. Clap, clap, clap. We all will give you a little bit of money to help you out. Do I care about you people? Is this really a value to me? Are you a value to me? Is this important to me? And nobody asks those questions, but it makes you feel good. That's the reward for the years of sacrifice, for not going to Paris, for not doing the things he wanted to do, for entering a profession he didn't want, for having a career he hated, for running a business badly and into the ground because, because he, he cared about people and not about money. So he never, he never uh, uh, you know, uh, um, um, what do you, what, what's the word? Um, called in a loan when people weren't paying it, right? But you see what altruism does is it embeds in your subconscious. It embeds in your hierarchy of values false values how the community is how other people think of you whether you're loved by other people family is a family is some floating wonderful intrinsic value um, a million other values that you don't actually choose you have never really thought about you've never really analyzed you've never really rationally figured out are these really values for me is what my depositors in my bank think of me important to me? So when you see It's a Wonderful Life, and so many of you see It's a Wonderful Life, oh, these are wonderful values. It's worth all the suffering to achieve them. Where? Why? Why is it so valuable? Who said? Where did these values come from? You've thought it through? you figured it out? Are they really the most important things in your life? And you interpret the movie to be positive because, so altruism doesn't come out as, 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 as what Ayn Rand portrays altruism as, right? It is that, but nobody preaches that. They always preach an egoistic motivation. Your life will be better in some way, either in this world or in another world. And it's not. It's not. What egoism says is not, egoism doesn't place how you treat other people as the central focus of your life or as a central focus of, of, of of ethics. What ethics, according to Rand, means is how do I live the best possible life for me? And what Ayn Rand says is that is not obvious. That you can't just absorb from the culture. That you're not going to get from religion. That you're not going to get from your neighbors. That has to be firsthand. You, you, every one of you has to, in a first-handed, original way, figure it out for yourself using reason as your guide. You have to abandon all the junk you were told as kids, all the junk the state has told you, your family has told you, preachers have told you, philosophers have told you, your friends have told you, you've read in books. And you have to examine your life in a fresh, first-handed way. First-handed means you, your mind, your values, and, and discover, figure out what are your values. Why are they values? You need to be able to explain why they're values. What are you willing to pursue them? What's more important and what's less important? You should have a whole hierarchy of values. Why? You have to be able to answer why. Not as some rationalization to justify a value you absorbed from the culture or from your parents or from your preacher. But why rationally is this a value in your life for you to make you happier, to make you living a better life? Why is it necessary for your survival as you, as a human being that has your particular characteristics? That's what's unique about Ayn Rand. That's what's unique about objectivism. And that everything else is infected with altruism. Now, was Oscar Schindler 
infected. I'm sure some of his motivation might be a feeling of guilt, unearned guilt, maybe earned guilt, because he helped the Nazis. But I think most of his motivation, the little I know about Oscar Schindler, was, was basically a human decency, a, a integrity, a, a, a sense of justice, and those are selfish, self-interested values. Whew. How does Dubai avoid being a target of terrorists? It pays them off. It, it, it funds them. It siphons money to them uh, through a variety of different ways. But that, I think, is the primary way in which it does it. Uh, the terrorists don't want to hurt the golden goose. It's a golden goose. And that's why I don't like businesses doing uh, uh, business in Dubai. I don't like people going to vacation in, in Dubai. I know it's a beautiful place because at the end of the day, I, all those charities, all, those, all the money that those sheiks give to the charities, much, much of that money, if not all, I don't, not all of their money, I don't know if most of the money, but a significant amount of that money, lands up in the hands of terrorists who are basically being bribed not to attack Dubai, among many other things. What do you think of magic mushrooms? I don't have an opinion of magic mushrooms. I, I know a lot of people who've, take, who've done mushrooms, have taken mushrooms. I, I also, my understanding, which is very limited, is the very little uh, uh, negative uh, or down risks associated with taking mushrooms. Uh, except having a bad trip, which can be very traumatic in your life. I've never done it. I, I don't intend to. I don't like to mess around with my mind. I don't like to mess around with my brain chemistry. Uh, I, I try to minimize impacting brain chemistry from the outside. You know, although I drink coffee and I guess, uh, uh, tr you know, take melatonin when I want to go to sleep. But I try to minimize it. Um, I don't think I would have a bad trip. I think, I think part of the bad trip has to do with personality, but I just don't see the value of it. If you get a great experience, it's, it's, it's somewhat of an out-of-body experience. It's an experience that you didn't really cause. You didn't really bring about. It was, it was, it was the chemicals just did it. From, so I'm not a big fan, but I, I, I don't think it's a big deal. Of all the drugs out there, I think mushrooms are probably the least problematic or one of the least problematic. I don't know. And again, depends how often you do them. You know, once in a lifetime, not too bad. Twice in a lifetime, okay. If you do them every week, you're sick and there's a real problem. What about regulation in the food industry? Food companies sell addictive high sugar foods. How does free market fix people's addiction to food? There's no addiction to sugar. I, I used to drink, I think at the peak in the 1990s, I was probably drinking... Six to seven cans of Coca-Cola, not Diet Coke, not Coke Zero. There was no Coke Zero back then. Coca-Cola, I hated Diet Coke. I think, I think this friend of mine who's actually in the room with me, he said to me once, if you do Diet Coke for 10 days straight, you'll get used to it. And at eight, day seven, I gave up because I, it was so disgusting. I can't think of anything more disgusting than Diet Coke. But I used to do seven, eight cans of Coke a day, uh, a day, a day. I used to have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, I, and one day I decided this is ridiculous. It's too much sugar. It's bad for me. It's, I'm getting, you know, I'm putting on weight. This, and I went to cold turkey and I just stopped drinking Coke. I almost never have desserts today. I don't have a craving for sugar. Uh, I once in a while will taste the dessert. Um, somebody else have. That doesn't cause me to suddenly have, you know, reignite my desire for sugar. The solution to sugar is stop eating it. The solution to high addictive food is don't eat it. If you can get off of cigarettes, you can get off of chocolate, you can get off of sugar. Now, chocolate has some addictive components in it, but I can go with days and days and days without having chocolate. And I love chocolate. I, I, I get the ones with the least amount of sugar in it, like 80-something percent uh, cacao and, and chocolate, uh, chocolate and, and very little sugar. Um, but no, I mean, the way... A free market solves it is if people out there have a preference for sugar, industry will create lots of food for sugar. And when people decide that sugar is no good for them and they want to help live healthy, good, productive lives, healthy emphasis on healthy uh, and, and energy stable lives, they will drop the sugar and then the food industry will have to come up with something different. So the market will dictate and our choices, our choices, each one of our choices 
You know, the beauty of it today, you don't want gluten. There's a whole gluten-free section of the supermarket. You don't want, uh, you're on paleo, then are paleo restaurants and paleo desserts, desserts, right? You can make, I guess, paleo cupcakes from coconut something flour or whatever. Um, you want, I don't know, you want to be a vegetarian or vegan, you can be a vegan. You want to only, only meat. I know people who only eat meat, only meat, no vegetable, no fruit, no starch, no carbohydrate, nothing. They, it's an Eskimo. It's called the Eskimo diet. Only meat. And they're fine. And if they only want to eat meat, then now, now you can, you can freeze dry the meat at home. And, you know, the, the tools to doing this, and you can take it on the road with you so you don't have to eat at restaurants because, God forbid, their meat is not grass-fed or Eskimo-like or whatever. Um, so, no, I mean, the beauty of the marketplace is if there's a large enough subgroup, if there's a group willing to pay enough money, create anything. No sugar, zero sugar, lots of sugar, whatever you want. That's the beauty. And if you want to smoke, there'll be cigarettes. If you want to eat sugar, there'll be sugar. If you don't want those, they won't exist. It's what the market wants. It's what people in the market wants. In other words, it's what we want. It's what our values are. Do you think that the recession will hit next year or so? And what could be the causes? Yeah, I mean, I think the recession will hit within the next 18 months. I know that's a little bit wimpy. I think the, the, the causes will be corporate debt. Um, I, I think what, what you're seeing already with Ford and GM and I think FedEx announced that they're seeing a significant slowdown in business is you'll see business slowdown and uh, then corporations, because of the business slowdown, revenue slowdown, will have a hard time paying debt. And, um, and, and you know, some companies will go bankrupt because they can't pay their debts. That'll put pressure on some banks. Um, that'll also put pressure on other companies that maybe are, they are suppliers to and so on. And, and you know, it, it'll be, a, I think, a corporate debt caused kind of crisis versus the big one, which I think is still in the future, which will probably be a government debt caused. Okay, whoa, we're way, okay, so no more, don't put any more super chat questions because we're going way over time. Uh, okay, let's, we're going to do one more Patreon, but let me get through these. The sentence structure of my super chat question earlier was incoherent since I clicked while s send while editing the question. I apologize for the incoherence. Hopefully, I answered it with coherence enough to overcome that. In your opinion, which countries are most socially and economically free in the world? Big fan of your work. Thanks for doing what you do. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for recognizing the value I provide um, to you. You know, it's not a matter of my opinion. So there are, there, are economic, there are indexes that you can find. You can look online, Economic Freedom Index, and there are two of them, one produced by the Heritage Foundation and one produced by Cato with, in association with the, um, I forget the name of a, a foundation in Canada, and they produce it together. And they rank countries based on how economically free they are. And I think the ranking is pretty good. So they find that Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Switzerland, Ireland, the U.S., those are the top three, six, six freest econo economies in the world. And by the way, the United States was number six under Obama. Uh, I think tariffs will cause the United States to drop in the Economic Freedom Index, although deregulation would make it rise. So I'm not sure exactly what the score will be under, under Trump. Corporate taxes lower will increase our ratings, so maybe, maybe it won't change that much. Um, but Obama, actually, under Obama... The economic, this, this is for all you Obama haters who think Obama was the devil and Trump was an inevitable saint to follow. Under Obama, the United States went from number 18 on the Economic Freedom Index to number 6. It actually increased its score in Economic Freedom Index under Obama, partially because of the Republican Congress, so the budgets were, uh, spending was limited, um, and, um, and a few good things. From, again, this is not me. This is these independent agencies that are putting these rankings together. Socially free, there is another ranking that does, I think it's called just the Freedom Index. And there, Singapore, Hong Kong drop a little bit. Um, I can't remember who scores. Our Scandinavian countries score relatively high because they are relatively economically free. So they score like in the low teens in economic freedom or maybe, maybe high single digits in economic freedom, but then they score very high in social freedoms. Um, freedom of speech, place like that, the United States scores pretty well, although less well than you'd expect. I can't remember who scores at the top, but Singapore drops way down 
on the on the total freedom index. Hong Kong is mixed. Um, but a lot of the European countries score very high. I mean, Ireland now, Ireland is, is one of the best countries in the world. I've talked about this in the past. It's very high on the economic freedom index and high on the social index. And now that abortion is legal, it, you know, it's high on the, again, on the social index. It's quite, from a freedom perspective, Ireland is, is, is actually quite good, quite good. Um, are, why are Israelis so obnoxious? Um, because we grew up in a culture that was hard and it was a culture where you you had to stand up for yourself and you had to assert yourself and it's also a culture in which everybody has an opinion and you're trained not to hide that opinion so at the dinner table everybody yells at one another uh, you know everybody everybody engages everybody has a conversation everybody and i think it's a positive obnoxiousness it comes from this sense of I have an opinion, I'm a human being, and I'm going to stand up for what's right, for what I think is right, and what my ideas are substantial, and I'm going to fight for them. So I, I think it's coming from a hard place where it was hard to grow up, where there was war and you grew up very fast, where you had to stand up for yourself, and come from a Jewish culture of debate and engagement and challenging and yelling and, you know, being in the conversation and not not being a wimp. Um, and it, when we grew up in Israel, it was about not being a wimp. It, it was about being a man, even if you were a kid. It was about growing up fast. It's about standing up for yourself. It's about taking the pain, taking the challenge, taking the struggle. You, you were going to die probably in the army anyway. Now, I think Israel has softened since. But at least when we were growing up, a lot of it was oriented towards those kind of ideas. How do you feel about those who guilt trip others? I think it's horrible. I mean, Jewish mothers, Catholic mothers, terrible. I think guilt-tripping others is a very, very bad characteristic. If you do that, stop it. If you do that, you should feel guilty, and you should stop it. Um, all right. We've got probably time for one or two Super Chat questions. You know, somebody has to give 20 bucks, right? We've done a lot of $2, buck fifty, or buck ninety-nine. We did some 5 bucks. Where's, uh, where's Liberal Deutsch who does $20 at a time? You know, somebody, somebody pony up some real cash. All right, um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, here we go. Why do we need a labor force participation rate in the first place? If all we want to know is who is not working, unemployed, doesn't the labor force participation rate just make it impossible to put today's unemployment figure in an historical context? The problem is that the unemployment rate the way they calculate unemployment rate, how many people are unemployed, not working, keeps changing and has changed many times over the last hundred years. And it's very, very difficult to compare. And I don't think the labor participa participation rate uh, necessarily, necessarily um, solves that problem. It's still a very hard number to calculate. Very hard number to calculate because it's very hard to tell who's not participating in the labor because they're retired and they don't want to or because they're, they've decided they're going to stay home to take care of the kids, whether it's a man or a woman, or, 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 or they've inherited enough money they don't have to work or whatever, versus people who are living in their parents' basement and playing video games and should be working, but uh, you know they're being spoiled rotten uh, so that they don't, they don't go to work. So it's very hard to tell what the labor participation rate, what the right labor participation rate is, right? So, it's, these numbers are very difficult. Like, for example, today, if you're not looking for work, if you're unemployed, but not looking for work, you don't count as unemployed when they put out the unemployment numbers. So, the, so when I say 3.7% unemployed, of all the people in America who are looking, or em looking for work or employed, 3.7 are unemployed, which is very low. But why are there so many people who are not looking for work? That's the question. And that's what the labor participation rate tries to capture. It tries to capture the number of people who are not working and are not looking for work. And if that number is 
too high, then there's somebody think probably structurally wrong in the economy. That is, if that, or, or, or in the culture. If that number is very high, particularly in young, young people, particularly among young males, then there's a problem in the culture. And the, since the Great Depression, the labor participation rate has been low. It's recovered a little bit in the last few years. It recovered a tiny bit under Trump, but not much at all, right? And the question is, why is that? Why are so many people not looking for work? Is it because, you know, uh, is it because we've created a culture in which people are not expected to work, in which people are not expected to take care of themselves, in which people feel entitled? Or is it because the economy has not created enough good jobs, the right kind of jobs? I mean, those are the kind of interesting questions that need to be answered. And from a policy perspective, theoretically, to be solved. Of course, the ideal is for the government to get out of the economy, for the government to get out of engagement with the economy so that, you know, we can see. We can see. And, and the, 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 the culture will kind of take care of itself, if you will, at that point. Um, so you need the labor participation rate to get, to get a little bit more insight into what's actually going on. Okay, Zach is asking, where do you want to get coffee next weekend? Uh, we have to talk, Zach, because next weekend's not going to work, so we're going to have to talk and figure out a different weekend. It turns out I have to go to Austin, Texas next weekend uh, for a memorial service for somebody uh, who passed away, unfortunately, recently. Um, but we, uh, you know, uh, text me and we'll figure out maybe there's another date that'll work. So the weekend of the 5th and 6th is now not going to work because I'll be in Austin, Texas. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's been an hour and a half. Thanks for spending this time with me. I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope you're going to have a great New Year. You know, New Year is a great time to think about your life, to evaluate it, to create that hierarchy of values, to figure out what you really care about and, and what you really value and what's really important to you. If you hate your work, then find a different work. Find work that you love. Uh, you should only, you should, you, every one of us can find work that we love. Every one of us can find something to do that both creates value for other people and therefore we get paid for it and creates value for ourselves. There shouldn't be a situation where for more than many, you know, for more than a significant amount of time, you are without a work, without a job that you don't love. Uh, the alternative ultimately is poverty, starvation, homelessness, a sucky life. The, 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 the solution is to really embrace, figure out what your values are and go pursue it. We still live in a world, we still live in a world in spite of all its problems where there are phenomenal amount of opportunities, there are phenomenal amount of opportunities for you, there are phenomenal number of variety of work, of jobs, of opportunities, of entrepreneurship, of new businesses you can start, new things you can create. And it's up to you. It's your life. You're responsible for it. Life is beautiful, although I don't like the movie. Life itself is beautiful. Um, embrace it. Jump on it. You only, as I said earlier in the show, you have one life. Every second that passes, you'll never get back. Every moment that passes, you'll never get back. Um, take advantage of it. Embrace it. Make the most of every single minute you're on planet Earth. Go live. And, and New Year's is a great time to think about it, to figure some stuff out about it, and to embrace it and commit yourself to it. That's what kind of New Year's resolutions really should be. It's not about whether I exercise or don't exercise. It's about a commitment to living life to the fullest and identifying the values necessary for you to achieve that kind of life. Have a great New Year's. I'll probably, probably have a show tomorrow. I'll probably have a show, a few more shows this week. So I'll probably be talking to you before New Year's. I'll probably do uh, an elaboration on what I just started, a discussion about New Year's, a discussion about New Year resolutions. But if I don't talk to you, or if you don't listen to the show before then, have a great New Year and um, go embrace life. Go live. Go live. Live fully.